Hi, everybody. Thank you so much for joining us today. Um, we will be recording this meeting for later purposes, but feel free to leave your cameras on and please mute yourselves. And if you have any questions, you can drop them in the chat and our moderators will take a look at them. But we should have time at the end for questions as well. Um, so this webinar is about the Long Island Sound Eelgrass Restoration Project that we have going on. I'm Emma Delacri. I'm the Associate Soundkeeper here at Save the Sound. And joining us today, we have Rob Vasilith. He's the CEO of Save Environmental and the brains behind this project. And then we also have David Siegerman, who is our Clean Water Communication Specialist here at Save the Sound. So for any of you who aren't familiar with our organization, we are a regional nonprofit that leads environmental action in the Long Island Sound region. Um, our work covers all of Connecticut, Westchester, New York City, and Long Island. And we work to fight climate change, save endangered lands, protect the sound and its rivers, and we work with the nature to restore ecosystems. So we have projects all over the Long Island Sound region. So as I mentioned before, I'm the associate soundkeeper. So I'm on the soundkeeper team at Save the Sound and we really focus on protecting and restoring clean water. Um, and we do this through hands-on science and community collaboration projects, legislative advocacy and legal action. So before we start our presentation, I just wanted to give a shout out to a couple of our partners. Of course, we have Save Environmental. As I mentioned, Rob Basileth is here, and this project is really his brainchild. But besides them, we also worked a lot and got a lot of assistance from the Cornell Cooperative Extension of Suffolk County and 11th Hour Racing, who are our funders for this project. I also wanted to give a shout out to the Fishers Island Seagrass Management Coalition for helping to maintain one of the last great eelgrass meadows in the Sound. Um, and for helping to allow us to um, use some of their stock at Fisher's Island as seeds. So just a quick outline on the presentation today. I'm going to be giving an overview on eelgrass and the history of eelgrass throughout the Long Island Sound. And then Rob's going to talk more about how he came up with this project and go through our three phases, which are seed collection, seed gluing, and the clam deployment. And then he'll talk a little bit about looking towards the future of the project and what our plans are going forward. And like I said before, we should have about 15 minutes at the end for questions and discussion, but feel free to drop them in the chat at any time and our moderators will take care of those. So for those of you who don't know, eelgrass is a rooted underwater grass that grows on the soft seafloor along shallow coastal waters of bays, estuaries, and beaches all throughout the Northern Hemisphere. It's actually the dominant seagrass in the Long Island Sound. And it's really important for providing food and shelter for migratory fish and waterfowl. Here in the Long Island Sound, eelgrass is specifically important for our flounder, bay scallops, and American lobsters. Eelgrass is also critical for helping to reduce coastal erosion. It does this through stabilizing the sediment and reducing wave energy during storm events. Eelgrass is also important for improving water quality. Um, <clears throat> Eelgrass acts as a natural filter of pollutants, including a lot of nutrients, and it sequesters a significant amount of carbon and then increases dissolved oxygen in our waterways. So overall, eelgrass beds are a sign of good water quality, good habitat for aquatic life, and acceptable levels of nutrients in our waters. And this is a picture that I took actually of the Fisher's Island eelgrass meadow when we went diving there. So as I mentioned earlier, eelgrass is the dominant species in the Long Island Sound, but unfortunately the populations have plummeted over the past 75 years. Um, <clears throat> so looking back, eelgrass was distributed all throughout the Eastern and Western Sound. But back in the 1930s, there was a wasting disease epidemic that caused a massive die off. And by 1933, 
It was estimated that approximately 1% of the original eelgrass population remained. Some other reasons for the decline include harvesting of eelgrass for paper, insulation, and roof thatching. So this is a figure of our current eelgrass distribution. After the 1930s, there was a slight rebound in eelgrass populations in the Sound, but this was limited only to the Eastern Sound. And this rebound was also limited due to increasing water temperatures due to climate change, increased nitrogen pollution, boating damage, and other construction and development along our shorelines. So if we look at this figure here, this is from the Long Island Sound study. Um, there was an aerial survey done to determine eelgrass abundance throughout the sound. And this most recent figure from 2017 is an estimate of about 1,400 acres of eelgrass left in the sound. Um, and if we looked at it today, it'd probably be even lower. So now I'm going to pass it over to Rob Vassalet, the CEO of Save Environmental, and he could talk a little bit about how he came up with the idea for this project and our overall goals. Rob, if you're here. Oh, Rob, you have to unmute. Thank you, Emma. Thanks for the presentation. It was, it was really great. I, yeah. Uh, I had a lot of fun diving with you for eelgrass seeds this, uh, this year. And, uh, and we wound up uh, with a successful project. We uh, made it over all our hurdles. And uh, we, for the first time ever that I, I know of, uh, is a seed-based method to plant eelgrass in the Long Island Sound. And uh, it's in mid-Long Island Sound. And uh, according to your map, it wasn't known historically for being in Smithtown Bay. But from my father and other people I know that are long past, they talked about that there was many patchy areas of eelgrass in the Smithtown Bay. So uh, we, we picked Smithtown Bay because it's close to my backyard. It's a place I grew up in. And, uh, it, and like you said, it hasn't been around in about 75 years. And uh, this project we did, uh, is the fifth open water planting I've done. Uh, I've done an open water planting with eelgrass seeds attached to clams. And, uh, the, the whole premise of doing that is, is that the, the clam will bury itself and this glue that we use is very strong. So it will hold the seed in place for the one to five months it could take for the plant to germinate. And, uh, as sediment accrues or disper uh, disperses from an area, the clam will raise and lower itself uh, and keep this seed in a really good position until it sprouts. And then it separates from the clam that it's glued to and it's on its own. And hopefully if uh, we get enough of them in there, we'll have a, an eelgrass meadow before long. No, it's, it's worked very successfully in the Peconic Bay, Shinnecock Bay, the Great South Bay, and uh, the third estuary, the major estuary of New York would be a uh, Long Island Sound. Uh, so we did this project with, uh, we, we collected seeds out of Fishes Island when they were mature in uh, late August. Uh, I think, uh, uh, I'm sorry, late July, last week of July and first week of, of August. And uh, these are the best seeds that exist that, are in the Long Island Sound. This, this plant grows as is, is, is tall as eight feet. And uh, it's just an amazing place to, to dive on and, and to, to see. Uh, there is no eelgrass that grows that tall anywhere else in New York. And uh, with it, we got these seeds and we were able to attach them to these clams, about 8,500 clams with uh, an average of 10 seeds glued on each one. We had a bunch of volunteers. Uh, and we made these uh, clams with, with seeds glued on them, and we stored them, and then we transported them, and then we, we brought them out onto this boat, and we met up with Save the Sound and uh, Cornell all together, and uh, we, we pulled it off. We, we deployed them into the water, and uh, 
this year we used a machine that I built and uh, it worked pretty good. Uh, it needs more work, but uh, it worked pretty good. <laughs> and, uh, yeah. And so, now we um, got to hurry up and wait for it to grow. <clears throat> yeah. So the basic concept behind the project was using clams to plant eelgrass seeds. So our three phases of the project was collecting the eelgrass seeds from Fisher's Island, then gluing these seeds to the clams and deploying these clams in Smithtown Bay um, to see if they'll grow naturally once the clams fall. And I believe we tried this out in the lab, right, Rob? Did you try it out in the lab before? Yeah, I started working in uh, Cornell Cooperative Extensions Lab in uh, 2016. And uh, it takes five months for it to germinate and grow. So it goes from 2016 to 2017. And it worked pretty well in the lab. Uh, but those conditions in the lab are pretty simple. There's no uh, turbulence, real world conditions. So, but it worked really good. And then 2018, we did a small open water planting in Laconic Bay by Sterling Harbor with Cornell. And uh, it was about 500 seeds with about 150 clams in it. And it worked. It worked pretty good. And it's still growing to, to this day. And it's it's actually grown and spread apart. And uh, it's blossomed. And then uh, I did another planting in 2020 with uh, Stony Brook, uh, Brad Peterson's labs. And uh, that did very well. And then I, I did a, a large planting in uh, the Great South Bay in 2021 with the Nature Conservancy's property that they maintain uh, in the Great South Bay. And that really did well. It was just amazing how much eelgrass was growing over a wide area. Started off as a one acre plant, but um, we planted them kind of late in December and the water was really cold. So the, the clams didn't really bury themselves for a couple of days. And we had a big wind and it, it blew off these clams into a wide area. And it's about a seven acre site now, maybe even 10 acres that, uh, it seems that these seeds are growing. So it's a two-year plant, meaning that it's a biannual plant. So mm -hmm. its first year will have like maybe four or five leaves of eelgrass that uh, uh, come out of the sediment. But the second year, it could have uh, 100 to 250 blades of grass coming out. It turns into like a bush. So this coming spring, I can't wait to go back to the Great South Bay and see how it's doing, you know, it might not be as good as I want, or it might be better than I want, but it's a, it's a pretty big area from a very small one acre plot. It's, it's really blossomed. So this yeah. planting that we just did in, in Smithtown Bay is the same thing, but it's over a two acre area, which is about 400 feet by 200 feet. And uh, I can't wait to see it in, 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 in June. We should see some really nice growth. And uh, I know from doing lab work, uh, I have remaining seeds that these seeds are just starting to germinate now. Not a lot of them, but it just starts around this month, the end of this month. They'll start germinating and sprouting. And I've been seeing signs of that. So I know that the ones that we put into Smithtown Bay are doing that as well. So uh, over the next five months, we're going to see a lot of germination. And by June, we should see some really good results. And I can't wait to see it. Yeah. So we're hopeful that our most recent planting will be pretty successful. And we'll be checking on that in the spring. Um, so as I mentioned earlier, 11th Hour has been funding our project. And a big part of the funding we received from them was to do some public education. And we decided to do this through the use of video. So we've been shooting a video series on the different phases of the project. And then at the end, we'll have a longer documentary on the entire project. Um, so I'm going to play this video now. This is a recap of our phase one, which was a seed collection. Not only is climate change killing off the eelgrass, it's also killing off the ecosystem service that e eelgrass provides. Well, this particular area has a very healthy eelgrass bed. 
It's got good current. It's got the right substrate. The Atlantic Ocean's right over there. You can see how it passes through towards Watch Hill. I mean, there's thousands of them down here. So what we do is we come in and we anchor up and the divers go in and the divers drop down to the bottom and they go through the eelgrass bed. And when they see a reproductive shoot, they, they pick it and it goes into a mesh bag. And then they bring all the eelgrass back up here, all the reproductive shoots with the seeds on them. They go into a cooler. And then one of the divers, Rob, will take these seeds to the uh, Cornell Extension Lab where they have tanks that are bubbling with seawater. And he'll put all the seeds in those tanks to preserve them. If we can expand all that eelgrass to that level, we're going to do our part for sequestering carbon. And we're just going to bring the whole sound ecosystem back into balance. And when systems are back in balance, the ability of them to have years of incredible abundance, it just increases. This is gonna take decades and I'll be long dead before we reach what I would consider a, a sustainable steady state, state on the sound. But there's been a lot of strides in the right direction and this eelgrass project's just one small cog in that overall vision. All right, so that was kind of a recap of our experience doing phase one seed collection this past summer. And again, I want to thank the Fishers Island Seagrass Management Coalition for um, helping to maintain that eelgrass bed. And <clears throat> yeah, Rob, I don't know if you want to talk a little bit about your experience diving there. Well, it was my honor and privilege to, to dive Fishers Island. The visibility was... Uh... Let's say we could see about 20 feet, maybe not so clearly, but it was about 20 feet we could see. And uh, it was beautiful. It was probably the best dive I've ever had in my life. I don't dive a lot, but, uh, and, and then, you know, at one point when we went off the edge where it drops down like 95 feet, uh, naturally the, the seeds will probably fall down into this abyss and not, never grow. But, uh, it was just beautiful looking down into that deep, dark blue water. And, uh, and we were there for a purpose. We were there to, to grab some of them seeds and to bring them further west into the Long Island Sound where they once used to be. And when we, when we bring these seeds back to, the, to Smithtown Bay, the mid Long Island Sound, it's going to help protect the water of Fisher's Island. And if we can grow these meadows back, which I'm sure we can, uh, it's going to help the water quality out tremendously. And uh, that's one of the major deficits for uh, eelgrass is bad water quality. So uh, a lot of work's been done over the years to, to upgrade the water quality of the Long Island Sound. And the water quality is at such a health right now where we can grow these plants and bring back these underwater forests, these meadows, which will help bring back uh, our fisheries that have been declining and uh, help sustain our biodiversity of, of all the animals and plants and shellfish that live in the Long Island Sound. I can't wait to see it prosper. Yeah. Rob, can I ask, Emma, I'm gonna interject here for one second. Uh, we, we had a question earlier. Um, about water quality. And, and I'm just wondering, or the, 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 ask, the question asker was wondering, how do water quality conditions compare across the test sites? So how does the water quality impact the feasibility for the, the eelgrass to, to grow and flourish in the, the places where you've planted so far? Well, uh, the thing about the water quality is uh, it's really about nitrogen. And uh, us humans have a tendency to overload uh, our bays and rivers and 
estuaries with oil and nitrogen, whether it's from uh, our uh, 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 septic systems, sewage treatment plants. Uh, naturally occurring nitrogen is necessary for all plants to live and, and, and to have a, a balanced ecosystem. But we, you know, as humans, we overload it, you know, and even with lawn fertilizers and road runoff, sewage treatment plants, septic systems, all contribute to this overload of nitrogen. And the problem with uh, having too much nitrogen in the water is the plant, eelgrass, uh, dedicates its energy to where it gets its nitrogen from. So if it's getting it from its stem and leaves, it, it doesn't dedicate the energy it needs in its root system. And the root system is everything to the eelgrass plant. It holds it in place through our storms, hurricanes, high tides, uh, king tides. And uh, when we have too much nitrogen in the water column, uh, the roots don't do well. And the plant will get ripped up in a little tiny storm and just be gone and never have a chance to keep growing or uh, reproduce with seeds. Yeah. Eel, eel grass is a pretty hardy plant. In one spot in the Mediterranean, there's a, 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 a plant of, of seagrass called Poseidonia. It's estimated to be 200,000 years old. And it all comes from a single seed, and it's the size of Manhattan. So it, it's a, it, seagrass is a very you know, resilient, but we just need to help them along. Yeah, it's definitely the best dive I've ever done in the Long Island Sound, um, being down there in the eelgrass meadow. It looks like an underwater forest, and it was really great. So I'd love to see more of that popping up along the sound. So I'm going to move on to phase two, which is our seed gluing and cleaning phase. And Rob, you could talk a little bit more about this before I play the video. What goes into the project after we've collected the seeds? Well, after we collect the seeds, uh, they're, they're still attached to these reproductive shoots that stem off this one stem that eelgrass plants make that produces seeds. And uh, so we, we, we take them from uh, the open water and then we bring them back to a lab and we let them sit in these bubbling tanks. And what happens there is they decompose. And as they decompose, the seeds fall out of these reproductive shoots and they fall to the bottom of the tank. And then we come in to clean them to get just the seeds, but not all of that, what we call rack, which is like a whole bunch of floating grass. Uh, we kind of remove that and collect the seeds. And then sometimes there's a lot of shells that, uh, there's these little tiny shells called uh, uh, lacuna snails. And they, they graze up and down on the eelgrass, constantly cleaning off the bacteria, keeping the plants healthy. And uh, they kind of get trapped when we, we collect these shoots. But, you know, so we separate some of them shells out, not all of them. And uh, we make it just so there's just seeds. So when we got a pile of seeds, we kind of put them on a, on a screen in front of us. And we take these live clams that we just pulled out of a, a fresh flowing tank. And we dry them off a little bit, maybe on a shirt or on a rag, and uh, put a little glue on them, dip them into the seeds, and then we put them on another rack, and then we store that until we're ready to transport them and then deploy them. So it's like a, it's a whole method of working with these seeds to do this work on clams, utilizing the clam to bury itself and to plant the seed. That's the whole gotcha of this project is we're using an animal to plant an underwater forest yeah i'm going to play the video so you guys can see a little bit more of what we did during phase two today uh we have assembled uh our, our live clams from uh New York State Hatchery, and we have collected our eelgrass seeds and cleaned them up and have them ready to do the work we're going to do. And I have this uh, special glue 
that we're going to use to attach the heel rest seats to these clamps. These are all the seeds we collected. <clears throat> Might not look like a lot. There's about 50,000 seeds here. Right on the apex of the shell is where we're going to put a little glue. We're going to dip them down onto the seeds. And then we're going to put them back on another tray. And when we have that tray filled up, we'll put them back in this flowing salt water tank to keep the plants alive and to keep the seeds wet. And then they'll stay in this tank until we're ready to transport them and deploy them. So what I came up with is uh, what they call biomimicry. It's mimicking what happens in nature. I was seeking out the symbiotic nature of illness with all the animals that it's connected to. And clams came up a lot. I just know that clams bury themselves. They're not that deep. Close proximity of where these seeds need to be when they germinate, they need to be buried. So what we're really doing is, you know, we're kind of forcing the clam to take seeds with it every time it buries itself. That's the mechanical advantage we're using with this animal. We got about three thousand done. We got another seven thousand to go. Get to work. Here we go. Here we go. <laughs> So that's kind of a recap of our experience during phase two of the project, which felt a lot like the arts and craft phase of the project. Um, <laughs> and we are lucky to have a lot of community support and volunteers come out and help us with that. And to um, for Cornell Cooperative Extension in Suffolk County for allowing us to use their space in the greenhouse and um, helping to provide us with supplies as well. So then moving on to phase three of the project, this was actually going out and deploying the clams. We just did this um, for this year, this past November, right before Thanksgiving. It was actually the day before Thanksgiving. And thanks again to Cornell. They came out with their boat and helped us to deploy the clams. Um, so we haven't had time to finish the video for this yet, but I have a little bit of a slideshow just so you can see what it looked like when we were deploying the clams. And then I'll let Rob talk more about his experience during this phase. <laughs> So that's a little recap of our phase three and it's a little bit hard to see in the video but the clams were dropping in the water off of this machine that was mounted onto the boat and this machine is actually something that rob designed and built so rob i don't know if you want to give a little more information on the idea for the machine and how that worked well uh when i first started working and thinking about how to restore eelgrass, uh, I was baffled that there was no machine that plants the seagrass. Growing up around farms and uh, knowing about farming and gardening and uh, planting seeds and 
in trees my whole life. I uh, I never knew there was no machine that that exists that 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 does this work. So when I got involved with doing eelgrass uh, and trying to figure out how to grow it, I wanted to be that. I wanted to build a machine. So that was my goal, and uh, that's what we did this past uh, November twenty fourth was my goal the whole time is to build a machine that does this work. So this is a prototype machine that I built. Uh, I'm mechanically inclined. I, uh, I I do a lot of fabrication work and uh, I operate a lot of machinery. So I, I kind of knew what I wanted to build and I, I needed something that could take these clams from these trays that we put them in and feed it into a machine. It's a, it's a conventional machine. It's uh, got a little automation to it. But it's a gravity-fed uh, eight-row clam seed with eelgrass seed sewing machine. That, that's the name of it. Uh, there's about 250, 280 machines in the world that do agriculture. So this is one that does the C. And uh, I, I, I named it the C of Baz. It's a, it's a prototype. And... Uh, I believe it might be the first machine that actually works in the world ever to uh, plant seagrass. And uh, with this machine, we could go long distances. We can go miles, but we just need enough product to, to put into the machine. And uh, it's a, it kind of patterns the floor with a tremendous amount of, of clams that are spread apart a couple feet. And uh, it, it's, it's the fastest method I could think of to grow eelgrass uh, at, at scale, to scale this method that I came up with, it would be to have a machine that does this work. And I built the machine part of it that I can. It's a, it's a simple machine. It's not a foolproof machine. It's not the best machine, but it's the first. So uh, in the future, there'll be more machines that do this work faster, better, quicker. Uh, but this is a start. Yeah. That, that's what I'm up to. And you could see in the video, the clams were sliding right off of it. So it ended up working really great. And we're excited to go check in on this planting in Smithtown Bay, hopefully early spring or summer and see how that's doing. So we, that I'm, I'm going to jump in real quick with, yeah. a, with a question that was asked. So, Rob, I know why you chose Smithtown Bay, um, but maybe you could just talk about what are the what were the what was specific to that? location the, the 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 depth of the water the the distance offshore what went into choosing that specific location where the planting happened where the deployment happened well when i was a child i uh i had a connection with eelgrass and uh it was in martha's vineyard with my grandmother's house there and uh i love being in the eelgrass and it was my first time i ever walked into the salt water i experienced eelgrass and, uh, you know, uh, I just, I really liked it. And then years later, I was fishing with my father in Smithtown Bay. And my father was uh, an avid fisherman and uh, he had a boat and uh, he used to take the family out. That was like, a, you know, a, a vacation every weekend is, is going to the beach, going out on the boat, being out on the water and, uh, in Smithtown Bay. And uh, I had a diving mask. And I came back with this grass that was growing in the water, but it wasn't the eelgrass from Martha's Vineyard. It was actually another grass, only the second other. There's only two underwater seagrasses in New York, and one's eelgrass, so it's Esther Marina, and the other one's Rupia, uh, or, or, or also known as widgeon grass. And that's a, another endangered plant that's sporadic, and uh, it kind of looks like a weed. And that's just what my father said. I, I said, Dad, this, this is the only thing growing down there. There's no eelgrass here. He goes, well, there used to be eelgrass here all over the place, but it, it's not around anymore. Maybe one day it will come back. And I was like, can we bring, can we bring this eelgrass from Walter's Vineyard back to Smithtown Bay? And he said, no, no, but maybe one day it will come back on its own. And uh, that was about 45 years ago he said that to me. And uh, that's why I want to plant eelgrass in Smithtown Bay. 
this is I want to bring it back. I didn't know, you know, I don't have to go all the way back to Martha's Vineyard to get this plan. I only had to go halfway there to Fisher's Island, which is about 70 miles away from uh, Smithtown Bay. And that's all I had to do. I didn't have to go 180 miles or 140 miles away. I just had to yeah. go to Fisher's Island and get some seeds. And <laughs> that's how, um, you know. Yeah. And as far as the specific area that we were driving the boat back and forth in and doing the planting, that was all determined through a DEC permit that the Cornell Cooperative Extension helped us to get as well. Besides Absolutely. the sentimental value of planting at Smithtown Bay. Not only was there a DEC permit, but before the DEC permit could be issued, I had to achieve a, a New York State Parks permit. Mm. So uh, so we have two permits. We're double permitted in the uh, and we're all looking forward to seeing it grow. So, and, uh, and next year we can enhance it. We could do some more planting again next year and, and, and make it a thriving meadow within a, a couple short years. That's a, a, a very large scale planting. Yeah, so that kind of leads us into the future of the project and where we see this going. So Rob, I don't know if you wanna talk a little bit more about that. Well, you know, uh, every, you know last year I did a one acre plot in uh, the Great South Bay, and, and this year we did a two-acre plot. So I always want to do more than I did the year before. And my plans for next year are, are very ambitious. Uh, between me and you, Emma, doing uh, three dives, we collected about 100,000 seeds, about 85,000 of them were very viable that we used. Uh, my plan for next year is to collect a million seeds. And the way we do that is we have a, uh, a, a volunteer dive team uh, that collects seeds. And we have a more robust project with a million seeds. And then uh, getting permitting for one spot was a, a long, arduous process. And now that I have one, I have a place to concentrate on for the next couple of years. But to expand, uh, there's other hatcheries on Long Island that are interested in using the clams that they grow in their permanent areas with gluing these seeds to their clams to do trials. And uh, there's five of them and I'm gonna go for all five. So they're East Hampton, Brookhaven, Hempstead, Oyster Bay, and Islip. Those are all hatcheries that have permanent areas to put clams in the water and have clams. And maybe with them, we can get some volunteers and if proven to be successful, maybe we can get some financial funding to uh, do work in classrooms and schools uh, and open to the public sessions. And, uh, and it's good. We meet a lot of people, we'll have a lot of fun. We'll, we'll really make these habitats come back and, and thrive again. That's the goal. Yeah. And I think something that's really unique about this project is like it is ecological restoration. So the sustainable nature of the project, when we go down and pick seeds, we are not pulling them up by the root. We leave the roots in. We're just taking off the tops of the seeds to uh, the tops of the plant to get those seed pods. So it is a sustainable project. And we're hoping, you know, to grow more eelgrass meadows, get them to spread again, which will help improve the water quality anywhere that they grow and well, to understand the, the estimate for the amount of seeds that are in one acre of that property that we were at at, at Fishers Island just one acre uh, could hold 10 million seeds yeah uh, and that's the that the great thing about the plant is, is that it can produce a lot of seeds that we could utilize the problem with the seeds is that they don't last so it's not like an oak tree. If the tree uh, makes nuts and they fall to the ground, 20 years later, it could grow. Eelgrass isn't like that. It has about uh, a less than a year time before that seed's no longer viable. So that was also part of the demise of the eelgrass is when it did get this wasting disease and the plant died off, there was no seed bank for these seeds to, to pop back up again. And that's why, you know, we need to help this plant out because it will come back naturally, maybe over hundreds of years.
But if we could jumpstart it by, uh, you know, bringing bringing seeds back, uh, we we got a pretty good shot of doing it in in, a, in, in maybe a decade to bring back thriving meadows that uh, you know bear its fruit. Yeah. Um, and with that, that's the end of our presentation. So thank you guys so much for being here again and listening. And we can open it up to questions and discussion at this point. Great. Thank you. I've, I've got some I've got a whole bunch of questions that I I, I would want to ask. And I, we have a bunch in here in the chat. We, we will certainly encourage people to to put some more in there. Let me go back to that question about um, selecting the, the sites. Um, aside from the, you know, the, the personal attachment and the sentimentality, which is, a, which is a great story. What were the other considerations for selecting the test sites? Was there water quality? Um, you know, was there a certain depth and time of year to plant and water temperature? What were some of those considerations in selecting where and when to plant? <clears throat> Rob, are you here? Yeah, I'm sorry. Uh, those considerations, uh, well, site selection is uh, most important for seagrass restoration. Uh, sometimes there'll be a, an area anywhere in the world that had seagrass that it disappeared and they try and bring back the seagrass there and they find out that the soil changed uh, from a sulfate to a sulfide. And, uh, Sulfide has a lot of microbes in it that aren't conducive for eelgrass to grow. So when you when you spend a lot of time, energy, and money into a restoration of seagrass, you want to pick a site that's very conducive to bring it back because uh, it's very easy to find a place that isn't a good location. Might have once been a good location, but no longer is. So you take soil samples. Uh, another thing that's done is... is uh, light meters so we want to make sure that there's enough light getting through so in places that are disturbed or compromised uh, they have bad light conditions so that wouldn't be a good spot to really try and bring back your risk and then temperature temperature is uh, an overwhelming threat to eelgrass here in new york uh, as the water temperature rises say in the peconics uh, in Western Peconic Bay, which is in the middle of Long Island there, there's no more eelgrass there. The water is just way too warm for it to grow there. So we have only find eelgrass in the Eastern Peconics, which is in cooler water that's closer to the ocean. And uh, that line of travel where it grows is moving further and further east. And with it, with the eelgrass disappearing is also the disappearance of the the, the most loved scallop uh, in the world, the bay scallop from Long Island. You, know. you don't find scallops where there's no eelgrass. So as the eelgrass disappears, so does the the scallop. So you know, saving eelgrass is saving scallops. It's saving a commercial industry, a recreational industry. Uh, and it's one of the many species that eelgrass supports, the scallops, clams, oysters. Um, and, and the list of, of supporting uh, animals is in the thousands for eelgrass. It's connected to every fish that comes into the Long Island Sound, the eelgrass. It provides oxygen. It, uh, it, it, it captures sediment. It, it, uh, it, it purifies the water. It soaks up nitrogen. There's a lot of benefits to it, and it you know, slows down erosion. Uh, it attenuates wave action. It's a, uh, it's worth our effort to restore it. It ha it's like the miracle plant that we've been missing. Yeah, great. Couple more questions coming up. One is about permitting. Um, who who is involved in in, in the permitting? Was and, and and was the DEC involved in just the permitting, or did they have any say in the in the in the site selection as well? Uh, they had no say in the site selection. It was approval of getting a site selection. Uh, and it was approval of having permission from the state parks. So if the state parks was willing to give me uh, a scientific experiment 
permit. Uh, then I had approval to use that property, which is a uh, submerged uh, property. Uh, and then the DEC had a lot of questions. You know, they wanted to make sure I was using hatchery clams, not wild clams. They wanted to know how I handled them, how I you know, picked them up, what, what type of glue that I used, that the, the glue's safe. They, uh, they want to make sure that you know, it's not going to be uh, detrimental to the environment. And they were pretty mm -hmm. thorough with that. And it's good. It's a good thing. Because, you know, I don't want to harm the environment. I want to help the environment. So if the DEC is going to find fault in what I'm doing, stop me from doing a bad thing, uh, I'm all for, for that. But uh, I answered all the questions and they were satisfied. And uh, it, it is an experiment. Yeah, you haven't answered all our questions yet, though, Rob. We've got a few more coming your way, uh, Emma. I, I don't. I wonder if you could scroll back a couple of slides. There was a question about what the what did the plants look like at deployment? They were still seeds glued to the to to the clam shells. Maybe you just go back to one of the shots of yeah, like that. There's a shot there that may just answer the question. Um, and and Rob, you said again there were about a hundred seeds harvested, about eighty five thousand seeds uh that went in the water yeah yep uh you know if you look at this picture in the middle uh you know some have like seven seeds some have 10 we were averaging we were trying to go for 10 uh so some have more some have less it's not an exact science uh but the way we do this work is exact so we're dipping the, the clam on to this part of the of the glue that it's not going to uh, seal the, the clam from opening and closing its shell. And when we dip it down onto the seeds, we, we don't know exactly how many seeds we're going to get, but we have an approximation. And that's what we're looking for. Uh, now, with the viability of the seeds, there's mm -hmm. a, about three different ways to determine how viable these seeds are to germinate and sprout, say. So I know these seeds that we, we gain from Fisher's Islands, they have a 20% viability rate, which is fantastic. So from the work that I've done in the lab and my experiments there, I, uh, I know that if I put five seeds on one clam with this 20% viability rate, I produce one plant. So that's the goal for every clam I put in the water, I want to produce one plant. So if we're putting 10 seeds with 20% viability rate, we could be getting two plants. And I like that. that that's good. And, uh, I was told there would people. be no math tonight, but that's yeah, okay. Well, that was good. Not, Thank you. you know, it's not calculus. <laughs> right. But no, so now there's another question that just came in. So the, the, the clams go into the water, they, they bury themselves. What, how, do the, how do these plants separate themselves from the the from the shells from the clams does it, does the glue dissolve do they as the clams move do they kind of shrug them off how do they separate well uh this this glue's got a really bad shear strength so when they bury themselves just the friction of from them burying themselves could knock off a couple seeds but get them underneath the soil none of the seeds that are on the surface will grow uh, these seeds have to be buried to grow to sprout and uh, when we, we do this work, we're, we're trying to get an average of five seeds. We want to get one plant for each clam. We're only gluing one side of the seed to the clam. The other side, uh, will that's where the seed will pop open. And once it does, if it's one month or five months later, that's when it becomes separated from its husk that it was glued to. Kind of like a, an acorn where the nuts on the inside, and it has a shell. It's the same thing with an eelgrass seed. It has an outside shell and kind of like a nut on the inside. So the side that's glued to the clam, it's not going to pop out from that side, but it will pop out from the other side. 
and that's what I've observed happening time again. And, uh, and, and then once it does, there's a couple of stems of roots that will be underneath the sediment and there'll be a sprout that's popping up or it's about an inch and a half long when it pops out of that seed. They have a little tiny seed that's two millimeters long. In one day, it will be about an inch to an inch and a half long. And once it pops, it really pops out of there. And it's pretty strong. And, uh, and at that point, it's separated. So the clams will move around a little bit. They might even get up and leave, but it won't affect the plant. The plant will be fine. I guess in some circumstances, it, you know, it could dislodge the plant into the, into the water column, but it's, I haven't observed that once, but it's possible. But, uh, basically, we're just, you know, the seed is adhered to the clam, clams holding in position over the months and months that it takes to germinate. And once it does, it's separated. I, ho I hope I can answer that question, you know, if I can explain that. That's the, the mechanics that happens. That's the natural engineering that goes on. So every once in a while, a seed will be naturally on the sea, sea floor and a clam will bury itself and a seed will fall into that hole. That one grows. And when it does, you know, the clam might be moving around a little bit, but it, it won't kill the plant. It's, uh, these plants are pretty tough. They could take on monster waves they are uh, they deal with every predator, fish, uh, it, 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 crabs, snails, everything, and, it, and they thrive. And they they build their own ecosystem. So in the world, there's four major ecosystems: there's mangroves, corals, salt marshes, and seagrasses. In our area of uh, the East Coast here, on the Western Atlantic, there's seagrass is the dominant species. So if we could bring the species back in places where it hasn't been in a long time, we, we have a good chance of bringing back a lot of the fish that we don't have around anymore, like cod, flounder, winter flounder, fluke, yep. bluefish, blackfish, sea bass. Uh, the list goes on and on. I can't even name them all. It, and it gets it's crazy. <laughs> it, it's interconnected and interdependent on the salt marsh and all the species that are around it. So and clams are one of them. Well, we're just utilizing the clam. We're giving the clams a nice home to hang out in, which is going to try and get them in protected areas so they don't get uh, dredged or clammed. Uh, and as long as they're in those places, the, the eelgrass that thrives there won't get damaged either. So we have to have like these marine protected areas for these sites. This site at Smithtown Bay is not protected, so anybody can clam there. But, um, well, that, you know, it, that's the way it goes. You, you talked about the, the the safe places for them to grow. And there was a question earlier um, based on the kind of the historical map that Emma showed earlier that the on the Connecticut side, eelgrass has thrived on the Connecticut coast of the of the sound as well. Are there any plans at any point to do seeding on, on the Connecticut side of the sound? Well, maybe Emma can talk a little bit about that. Uh... Uh, the problem with uh, doing this work that I do using clams in Connecticut waters is uh, they don't have any hatcheries in Connecticut. And they don't utilize them and it, it's not part of their law. So at this mm -hmm. point, with my method, we cannot do this work in Connecticut waters. Maybe the law can change, but, uh, but right now we can't really do this work in Connecticut because Connecticut, with, with my method, with, there's other methods that can be used. And there's, uh, there's several, uh, but right now we can't use hatchery, <coughs> hatchery clams in Connecticut, excuse me, uh, until that gets approved. Maybe for restoration purposes, it will get approved sooner than later, um, especially after we see the results what Smithtown Bay does. And uh, it, it could be a, you know, it, and it would help the commercial industry, uh, the fishery, uh, fisheries for fish, recreational, 
if we could bring back these eelgrass meadows to the Connecticut side in the Midwestern Sound would be fantastic. But uh, there's no easy way to do it. This method I have is pretty affordable. Um, we could go long distances. There's other methods that do work. Uh, but all of them, you know, involve a community, uh, federal agencies, state agencies uh, to get it done. And so a more robust uh, planting is coming next year. And that's what I'm going to be working on is I'm going to go for seven sites next year and millions of seeds with tens of thousands of clams. And, and, and the, that's how you, you do it. You just you keep piling it on. You keep going. You do more than you did the year before. That's my goal. Well, and we'll I'm, be putting out the call for volunteers for, for all those gluing days. Uh, yeah. We had someone who, who asked a question about Buzzards Bay. W what I'm going to do, if there are people who have questions or have uh, or want to get involved in some way, I'm putting my uh, email, I saved the sound, in the chat. Uh, you can certainly feel free to email me and I can connect you with Emma and, and Rob and, and some other folks who are, who are, again, as Rob just said, this kind of takes a, takes a community. Um, before we go, I do have one question or one thing. I, Emma, you, you talked about some of your favorite dives, but you actually got certified how long before you were able to go on this, this the first Fisher's Island dive? That's pretty cool. That was a bit of an 11th hour race itself, right? It was. It was. Um, I worked a little bit on this project last year when we did one of the dives, but I didn't have my certification at that point in the summer of 2021. So I wasn't able to actually go in the water. So then this year I was rushing to get my diving certification before we went out on our first dive and I actually ended up getting it the day before. So the dive at Fisher's Island was my first ever um, actual dive just on my own. And like I said, it was really beautiful. I've done a couple of dives since then in like city Island, a couple other places in the sound Bridgeport, um, and nowhere looks as good as there. And it was really great just to see what a healthy eelgrass meadow looks like and the potential that, you know, the other areas of the sound can look like that as well. And how much wildlife was in there. So it really inspired me. And I, I'm just super excited about this project and I can't wait to see how it works. Yeah, we are, we have just about out of time, um, but I do have, we have one more question that I want to ask Robin. And, and this is, again, I think this is going to lead to some more math. Uh, you said that, you know, on the three dives, each of you, so six total dives netted 100,000 clams. Is, is your... Jeez. Uh, seeds, right? Sorry, is is the is the basic math to just add ten times as many dives? No, to no, get a no, million seeds. Or is there the another way to do that? Abundant area in all of New York waters for the amount of seeds that are produced on plants. Uh, like I said earlier, that, that this plant can grow eight feet tall there, and we saw it. Uh, typically, though, that uh, eelgrass doesn't grow that tall in other areas in New York. Um, does pretty well in Orient Point and the outer ends of the conic, maybe four feet tall. And then on the South Shore, it's like two, two and a half feet tall. And it produces a lot less seeds. So maybe when you pull a reproductive shoot on the South Shore, you get, you know, a hundred seeds. You pull one reproductive shoot from Fishers Island, you can get 400 seeds. Kind of like that. It's a it's a four to one difference. So doing eelgrass seed collection on the South Shore is a lot more. Sorry, uh, than anything else. Uh, but we 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 were really lucky to to have this spot in in Fishers Island. It's just it's the last remaining DNA of all the eelgrass that ever grew in in the Royal Sound. So it's appropriate to use those seeds and before long so this plant takes two years to grow to where it makes its own seeds so in a couple of years time this meadow that we're growing in smithtown bay will be able to collect seeds from there and those are the seeds that grow there and that will be our donor site for seeds that's the real goal and 
the thing about using seeds is it, it brings uh, genetic diversity with the eelgrass meadow instead of doing transplant where you don't, don't have a great genetic diversity. Using seeds is, is the number one way to do restoration work when it comes to eelgrass. So if we could set up this spot in the next two years, say, maybe three, uh, we, we could get this place to become our donut bed. And, you know, there'll be no need to go out to Fishers Island. And we'll know that those seeds that are produced there are from plants that are growing there, which is more conducive for growth. So, and then we could always intermingle other seeds from the South Shore, because traditionally there was birds that ate these seeds and they migrated north. And from their poop, they would naturally recruit areas of eelgrass. But in real time today, there's not a lot of eelgrass left and there's not too many of these birds left. So forcing these seeds to grow with the, any method is, is a really good idea. And then when it comes back, these eelgrass meadows, they'll produce their own seeds and we could use those seeds to collect locally with the community and, uh, and, and do more restoration work further west, going in, even into the, to the waters of New York City would be the goal. So it's to push back from where it's still existing on the east end of the sound, to, to move it back west. Yeah, thanks again so much, everyone, for coming. You can find our social media pages at the top of this slide. And again, feel free to email David Siegerman if you want to get in contact with me or Rob, and we'd be happy to talk to you more about this project. But thank you so much for spending the time with us, everyone.